Okay, I guess I'll start. And um, the reason why I chose this book for the last three classes is because, okay, so we're getting focused in, you know, what is a healthy psyche? It's one book, it's one person's reaction to another person. It sort of brings up a lot of issues that you might want to include in your final. It, it's an argument about what a healthy psyche is and about how much science can make our psyches healthy and, and what are the limits to science. And also how should the sciences, the social sciences and the humanities come together for a new uh, uh, model for education that integrates science, social science, and humanities. And so he recommends a new integrative knowledge. And my response is actually you can start out with the old stuff and then you can bring in science and add to that. Instead of starting with science and all of a sudden creating, realizing that the humanities are valuable, you could also start out with the humanities and say science has improved our ability to live the life of the mind, but the life of the mind is still the goal. Um, so, um, we just come at it from different directions. And um, I, I think the debates between us is just, uh, I hope, a good touch point for all of you to start thinking about what you think. A healthy psyche is how to get it, um, what kind of life it is, what sort of education, how to develop it, how to sustain it. Um, and what does your liberal arts education, how does it, it's structured for you to not only get a complete education, but also educate uh, the moral and intellectual virtues and educate you for a healthy psyche. So in your final papers, the more you can integrate your other classes, the more you are creating this model of integrative knowledge. So Mr. Damasio says, yeah, moving into the 21st century, this is what we need. And, and I agree with that. I think definitely uh, there's a lot of things Aristotle did not know about science and social science. And then there's the including women, including everybody in the world on this model. Um, so definitely we can just keep growing the model, but I hope that each of you comes up with your own way of synthesizing all the classes you've taken so far in K through 12, college, both in terms of the content of the class and also the process, right? So a student was uh, talking to me about, well, what would you like in the, in the paper? Do you want an abstract? Do you want a description of your research methods? That's social science, okay? And so, yeah, there's a difference between what I'm looking for and a social scientist because um, I'm looking for an idea that you have and you've read some social science research. So, you know, the process is for you to read stuff and come up with uh, a new idea, a way of synthesizing it, a way of figuring, well, what does that uh, result in the social science? What does that imply for some bigger picture, right? for a more of a philosophical question. Uh, in your research papers, uh, in general, now each one will be different, but you do have to think about when the person is doing the research, what is the underlying philosophy that they have? 
are they utilitarian? Are they Kantian in their approach to the process, the methodology, and maybe maybe the content of what they do? Um, for example, you know, there's tons of research where people, the surveys, does this make you happy? <laughs> Aristotle would say, no, you don't just ask people that. That's the biggest task in life, right? Is to ask yourself, what is human happiness? And how can I hold myself to a standard? How can I teach myself to flourish and feel good about it, right? And believe in it and keep, keep my mind on the goal. I want to develop all of my capabilities. That's very, very different from how do you feel today? Does COVID make you happy? Oh, go. I, of course not. Um, but I, you know, I'm always looking for what's that ghost in the machine? What is it that they're assuming? What's kind of their worldview? And I read an article recently in the in the news. And it just said, um, no. Oh, let me see. That people are actually more resilient than the psychologists thought they would be, right? So the psychologists were all thinking, oh, everybody's going to just, you know, collapse into depression or something. And oh, here we go. How the pandemic did not affect mental health the way you think. Well, you know, first of all, this is an American, this is about people with privilege, right? It's not about people, most people in the world, most people in the world don't have access to the technology to do your little survey, all right? So already you've got, uh, how is it that privileged people are not affected as much? Well, and then they didn't, they didn't factor in things like how many of the people affected um, had a, a big support system of extended family or whatever, how many of them were women, how many of them had kids. Um, and then they did say people who were poor, you know, and became desperately poor. Yeah, that, that didn't make them real happy. <laughs> but I think... I do think that if you dig a little deeper, you might find out that friendships are really important, that there, people are finding the middle ground between extremes. People are um, not complaining about what they can't control. You know, if you just dig a little deeper, I think you probably would find that they have that inner dialogue or the dialogue with other people that is that model for human flourishing. But the research isn't gonna have that in it because it's not what it's looking for, because it's not what the notion of the psyche that it's based on. So it's more based on utilitarianism. You just ask people, you know, are you happy? Um, what is it that is your greatest pain or your greatest pleasure, whatever? and people can just respond. Um, the thing that I find a hard time with also is that you can take a survey one day and come up with some patterns and then 9-11 happens. And like all of that research is right out the window because everybody changes or the economy collapses or COVID happens. So it's just, it's a ship without a rudder, you know? And um, I think that people might answer those surveys according, well, they do, there's been research about, um, they gave somebody, uh, somebody, some people found a $5 bill on the, on the ground before they came into the, 
uh, survey place and other people didn't. And lo and behold, you know, just based on that, they scored higher. So how legitimate is data like that, right? If it's just so based on your mood. Um, so I'm just not sure about some of this, some of that research, but I'm glad that all of you have to do it, right? You have to do some research in social sciences because AUW students are doing serious research, right? Things they need to find out about, about public health and about related to their careers. So it's not trivial social science and that's good. And that's why I think that you should, you know, write your papers where you synthesize what you can learn from social sciences about a healthy psyche, what you can learn from philosophy and what you can learn from just the physical sciences, the physical part of it. And then when I taught, right, I taught that um, this might look good, like utilitarianism might look good. And then Mr. Hedges writes about how Americans have gotten, they take that positivist, positive psychology and it's based on utilitarianism, but it's very manipulative. So you can, any of these views can get corrupted and then Kant's view can get corrupted. And um, so that's, I want you to be sort of critical thinkers about views of psychology um, because of the, the irony about teaching psychology is that you're using your psyche while you're reading the stuff, right? And so it's literally stimulating your psyche in a way that, you know, fits fits the model that you're reading or it doesn't fit the model. It's just, it's bizarre because in order for you to understand the material, you're literally engaged in, in the activity of having, using your psyche. Um, but so I hope that all of you have read it and I hope, you know, everybody has a reaction because that's where we should start. And um, the next class, next, what for you, Sunday, is the last few chapters of Damasio. And I do want you to come with some sort of um, final comment on all three assignments in Damasio. And then I'm gonna have you meet once final week. Um, I think it's the 27th on the Tuesday. And then I'll, um, I'll ask you to give an outline of your research paper, what you plan to write for your research paper, because then you can get ideas from other students and you can also ask other students questions. So it's instead of having an official chunk of time for your final, it's a chunk of time for your outline for your final paper. Um, all right, so let me start with um, comments. So Amal, did you have a comment? Yeah, um, so I read both chapters and like one thing that stood out to me was um, from chapter eight when uh, the reading oh. talked about the irrationality of emotions. I think like, um, and said like how it's important to you know that some emotions are um, you know more rational than others and it also mentioned that individual flourishing is inseparable from others so what i want to give an example and relate to is that you know this uh, um, advancement of technology and the uh, for example the social media made us um, have these irrational feelings such so, like for example in social media like we think that like those um, friends connections and people that, that we follow they might be celebrities or um, anything so they're leading us to more interesting and you know rewarding lives uh, so we think that that's the uh, you know the ideal 
a way of being or like the way we, you know, uh, we see how they are living. So that creates the desire, you know, to be uh, always addicted to know, you know, what they are up to and how their life is uh, going. So I think like this feeling are irrational because, you know, we, we create this uh, idea of, you know, the ideal word or, you know, the ideal way of living and we think that it applies to us. And I think like it's not, that's not based on, you know, logical thinking. Um, yeah, so that was my reaction. It's based on fantasies, right? Right, it, exactly, you just project yeah. your own sort of fantasies, and that person isn't their brand, you know. That person has a life, <laughs> and it has ups and downs and all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah, so that's a way technology has split our heart from our head, right? And it educates it mis educates our imagination because we imagine a life that isn't a real life. Does that make sense? Yeah. That was why I didn't want my children to work. Yeah, that's just trying to be the mind-body unity also. Yeah. What? I think like, uh, uh, like the mind-body unity. Yeah, okay. Uh, like prevents us from uh, having. So when Mr. Damasio says you develop a sense of self and then an autobiographical self, um, I think this started with TV and uh, sitcoms. People actually thought those people in the sitcoms were people, right? With this history and this, right? And, and their lives, and they weren't real people at all. Like they were uh, script writers whose lives would come and go. Oh, good. Okay, go ahead, Sabakun, go ahead. Can you read that or can you say it, Sabakun, or should I just read it? it do you know BTM Army? BTS, yeah, BTS, <laughs> at least the fans I meant to, to carry that as a badge of honor, as though it's the, the band is their brand. Um, okay. well, yeah. is, that the, is that the Korean, excuse me? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, so Professor, uh, at least the fans that I've met, they tend to be very, I mean, in a very, um, I don't know if, I've, if it's right to call it toxic, but they tend to be extremely protective or I don't know the right term to use it, but if you say anything against the band, they tend to act viciously and they're all in the comment section trying to prove themselves or, um, you know, BTS came this far and that. They tend to know more about BTS than they know about themselves. <laughs> no offense to BTS uh, fans out there. I like BTS too. But then, yeah, that that it kind of gets to me, the fact that um, why would you have to stand up for a band so passionately when, you know, they're resting under air conditioning, but then you're here out in Nepal or Bangladesh and you're struggling, but you have to stand up for these rich people so passionately, yeah. Yeah, I, I would like you to just realize that your AUW sisters are the real heroes of this world. I mean, exactly. you, guys are, you, you guys are doing things so much more heroic than so many of these people people admire. Even you admire these people and you are actually more admirable. I mean, it just drives me nuts. <laughs> Relatable, Professor, I completely relate to that. Just believe in yourself, just realize how far you've come and that you have so much potential. Um, yeah. 
it it is crazy but what you want to do is you want to map that okay so yeah i'll talk about the greek stuff they're trying to give you a realistic image of life in the back of your mind so you know what you're up against and they really every character makes a mistake like there's no fantasy characters right they're all flawed and they're all they run into really complicated situations and they sometimes the options available to them the best option is really awful but it's still the best i mean it's really like life <laughs> But it doesn't, the people who are real heroes are the ones that actually make the best decision among bad decisions over and over and over again. And they never get put on a pedestal as a hero, but they actually are because they dealt with other people's problems and sort of tried to clean up the mess. Does that, does that make sense? Those are the real heroes, right? We just have to get a very different picture in the back of our head. And I hope you can, you know, really think how profound that is, the corruption of the imagination and the kind of person you want to imagine yourself to be and the kind of situations you are in right now. <laughs> but also, it, you know, it, it'll always be complicated and, and you won't try to run away from that. That's where the heroism really comes in. So um, I talk too much. So Isabel, what about you? Professor, um, actually I couldn't manage to read it, so I still don't have something to say for now. Okay, Ritika, do you have something? No, Professor. Okay, so um, I hope that you all are keeping up um, and yeah, I'm not going to be able to read posts very quickly, but you know, you need to post them anyway, and then I'll get to them when I can. So, uh, Fardeen? Uh, hello, Professor. Hi. Um, when I was uh, reading, um, it was really fun reading the like reading Dimazio's point in connection to the archetypes. It reminded me of the Greek goddesses class, and like you said, this last class, and it's in the book as well. But it's like to me, it's so on point that um, the uh, Apollo archetype is like the dominant one within Dimazio because it's like he is good at what he does, and he is well intentioned as well. But still, there is this emotional maturity that he can't quite connect his his work to like how it would actually like impact society, and he's a little delusional about that. And like I, around me, I always see these people who are amazing at science and technology, and they are really good at what they do. But there is that lack of connection, and I like I find myself hoping quite often that I hope like. <laughs> I hope they get better at making those connections and our society encourages them to make those connections more because otherwise all these incredible stuff that they're, you know, discovering and coming up with, it's going to get abused and that's, that's something you don't want. So yeah, that's what I thought. Good. I'm just hoping all of you can, you know, the light bulb will go on because I know a lot of you say that in the best high schools, all the students are encouraged to do science or to become doctors or you know, computers with the assumption that that will develop your country, right? And, and you know, it's, it's way more complicated than that. Does that make sense to all yes. of you? Yes, professor. Good. Uh, no, not country. It's more about family prestige. Okay. Uh, all right. She says it's family, but. Um, I can relate to that, to the family prestige. Okay. So, so here you are. You're at this liberal arts college where you have to take all this stuff that's not science 
And it's yeah. like, yeah, how come I have to do that? And maybe it'll dawn on you that, oh, I got so to do that. Go ahead. Yeah, people ask me like, uh, so at the end you'll be a engineer or a doctor. I t when I tell them, no, nothing for now, like, uh, I don't have that label and they will be like what kind of education you're getting if you're not becoming an engineer or a doctor. Yeah, so I can relate to that. Oh, I hope all of you can, right? I really just hope that, that reading literature, like reading Dancing in the Mosque, reading, you know, Sojourner Truth, that stuff really, Mr. Damasio could have used a little more of that, right? It, Sojourner Truth wouldn't have gotten where she got if she'd taken one of his opioid pills, you know? <laughs> she needed to have an idea of the good that sustained her. Um, does that make sense to students? Oh, I sure wish I could see you. But so if it makes sense to Amal, then it makes sense to all of you. <laughs> it's the only face I can see. Um, okay, Falak. What did you get? Hello, Professor. Yeah, I agree with your argument that uh, Damasio does not recognize that his drugs could be uh, misused by some people, and then that he's too confident that the drugs will be only used by wiser people. Yeah, but that's too simplistic. I guess, yeah, that's it. Can you think of any examples? Right now? Yeah, can you think of the overvaluing of science as it's going to save us? Or it's going to lead, it's going to lead to our development. All we need is more science or more doctors or engineers. Can you think of examples where that that's kind of the spirit of the times in your country or you know, unexamined assumptions? Um, I have to think, Professor. Okay. Um, yes. So, Aurora, what about you? Yes, Professor. Uh, chapter 8 is based on Damasio's views on many topics as archaeological representation on Apollonius analyzing. Uh, Damasio has tried to combine his science training with philosophy, the ability of human beings to develop enables them to live first. Damasio thinks that one of the best ways to create a neural map for a person is to read Spinoza. Myths give a pattern about Apollo where a person is obsessed with the Apollo type behavior. Apollonia varieties have an immature sensitive life. One of the Apollo's biggest weakness was sexual attraction. He often chased after Aphrodite's young and beautiful woman, for whom he never felt any intellectual respect. But when he didn't get any signal from all those women, he became aggressive towards them and took revenge. In fact, Apollo was quite indifferent to injustice and justice. Apollonius' logic is now being used all over the world to lead human culture to us as asceticism and injustice. However, the goal of Damasio, Spinoza, and the ancient Greeks was to enrich human propaganda. The main teaching of Greek text wants to inspire people to strengthen or reorganize their soul character mind which Damasio abbreviated as neural map versions. The Greek text clearly shows that some form of self-preservation and good deeds of a person can destroy themselves as well as everyone affected by their choice. And uh, in chapter nine, a lot has been said about drug addiction. I wanna say something in terms of this drug addiction. Um, if we want to find out this cause of addiction, we must first understand what we get as a result of addiction. In other words, uh, addiction meets some special needs of a person which are not being met in his or her life. Lack of attention at some stages, uh, loneliness and stress causes people to become emotional. 
addiction or drug addiction is a mental or physical condition that is created by the interaction of a living creature with the drug and it causes physical harm to addicted person as well as mental and moral. This leads to degradation and causes harmful reaction in society. When we look at the pages of the story, we see that the history of drug addiction is quite ancient. In the beginning, alcohol, china based church, cigarettes, etc. are used as drugs. Later, drugs took over the place. Scientists have revolutionized medical science by inventing a variety of life-threatening painkillers or drugs that is slowly gaining popular popularity as drugs. Usually, people interpret it as relieving them of pain, keeping them away from stress, and giving them a sense of control in any situation. They feel like they're really alive, excited, uh, feeling good, and so on. I think when people suffer from uh, severe depression due to failure or imperfection and then drug taking drugs lead them to a kind of intense dizziness which causes them to have these kind of feelings. Yeah, Professor, I got this. So did you agree with it? Did it make sense to you? Yeah. Okay, good. So again, if you haven't started your research papers, if you wanted to write one on what are the causes of drug addiction, right? And then you could compare that with Mr. Damasio, right? So if the yeah. cause is loneliness, taking a drug is not gonna cure it, right? You have to, you have, to have friends. Um, At first one should have safe control on him or her. Right, what? One should have self-control. Right. Okay. So, I mean, I certainly think the drugs might be able to break some of the bad habits people have, right? Like yeah. maybe you really do want to change your relationships and you want to get into a, get out of your family or get out of whatever toxic community you're in, get in yeah. another community. Well, then maybe the drugs can break that habit of feeling over powerless right? Because yeah. you, you know, it develops this brain chemistry where you get in these old habits, but it can't move you forward, right? The only thing that can move you forward is that you actively start relating to people or to nature or to something. Does that make sense, Aurora? Yes, Professor. And I professor, don't, go ahead. <laughs> is there any like uh, biggest uh, benefits for people who are taking drugs they okay. think so. <laughs> like, how, I, have, how, how I have one student who is just preaching. He's like a preacher. You must take mushrooms, Dr. Beck. I mean, they're so wonderful. <laughs> it's like, fine, you know, they, they, I honestly what think is, this young man had a very abusive father and taking those mushrooms really saved him from those old habits and that's fine i'm not going to tell him that though right but he just proselytizes <laughs> he just he can't get over it he can't he'll talk about the drugs and say that's fine you know i i perfectly believe that that it did you and then he goes and you need to do this <laughs> just, oh, so wow. so isabel the answer to that question is first of all, they think so. Second of all, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, they might be right, but they're only right if this young man has left home and now he's living in a totally different country and he's making a new life for himself. And so it's the combination of those two things, right? If he were still living at home with his abuses, dad, he might do mushrooms every day, but you know, it doesn't, you, know, it's not, you gotta have a life. You can't just have mushrooms, you know? Um, <laughs> so I do think that stuff has been shown to really, you know, reduce anxiety, but basically you have to learn how to live your life to reduce anxiety, you know? Exactly. Yeah, okay, Isabel. That's a yeah. philosopher though, do you understand? 
that's somebody who thinks, yes, you know, I'm not going to be anti-science. It's just that I'm not going to worship science. They're not, you know, they're not going to save us. We have to have ideas ultimately. Um, and that examination of yourself, right? But Is then, that um, go ahead. Professor, um, usually when we make a point, especially on the internet, People tend to ask us, okay, what are your sources? Where are you saying this from? How is this backed up by science? So people in general uh, these days, they want people to be educated in science, perhaps even like have a PhD or something before they allow anyone to make a statement. So it becomes very difficult to have a meaningful discussion or a discourse with people. Even if um, I find myself with my friends or classmates, I'm talking to them and I make a statement I mean, as little as saying, in my opinion, and they can get offended and become very defensive and say, okay, what are your sources? Where did you get this from? And la, la, la. And it's not enough for me to say, this is just what I think. This is how I've synthesized the knowledge that I have and the conclusion that I've come to. Yeah, so we can, I've, okay, I want you to understand this. Do you remember we're talking about Aristotle, the idea of the good? And that's why I brought that up. Plato, your mind, your noose is your idea of the good and it drives you, but you exactly. have to examine it all the time. Now, you've had this class. Do you remember? The Enlightenment thinkers threw it out, right? And they replaced mm -hmm. it with just data or just right. abstract principles. And yeah, I, oh my gosh. They have eliminated the mind. They don't even know, right, that they've done it. And I was reading some article by a social scientist. Or it drives me nuts because it is mindless, right? It's like, I keep asking, well, why, why? Like, what's good about all these things you're saying? Or they can't, they just won't say anything unless they'll say, well, there's 20 studies that say blah, blah, and there's 10 studies over here and they just won't engage, right? It is truly mindless and it truly drives me nuts. Um, <laughs> Professor, can you like give an example of, of the things that seem mindless to you? Okay, so there was a book about um, the virtues and sustainability, right? So huge book um i was thinking well i've thought of this for 50 years you know that's why i got into this was that overstepping the bounds is the ultimate sin it's ignorance delusion and so we have to integrate culture and nature right so i try reading some of these articles and they're just so reductionistic they're just they sort of say you know, in this study, um, uh, I don't know, humility turned out to make people happier or something like that. And it was just, the person is not going to commit to anything, but they, you know, clearly they have an agenda. Um, I, I don't know, maybe next time I'll, I'll bring it in and Maybe that would be helpful too to you because you would then kind of understand that there is a philosophy and there is a kind of brainwashing going on, even though people think they're being objectives. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Pollock says the scientists thought Agent Orange, oh my gosh, would save their crops, but it didn't work well. Um, now it's used by many countries to destroy the crops of the other countries. Well, that was the Vietnam War, right? Uh, people thought science. Yeah, sometimes the science is just inaccurate. Um, yeah, okay. So yeah, Sabe Kun, I was, if the reason you're depressed is because your family has labeled you the black sheep, right? And your community all thinks of you as the black sheep for whatever reason. Actually, my grandpa was like this. 
anyway, <laughs> yeah, I come from good stock here. Yeah, I got that. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm not somebody whose relatives came over on the Mayflower or something. Um, but anyway, so everybody around you at your church, you're the black sheep, you know, you need to get out of there. Like just taking some depression drug is not going to help you unless it just makes you live in la la land so you can deny everything around you. So that's what I'm saying is you got to get another environment where not only you start over from scratch. I mean, you have, you're on your feet, right? Somebody gives you a job, gives you a chance to start over. When you get out of prison, you know, in our country, there's no rehabilitation. You go right back to the old neighborhood well, I mean, you could be taking some drug against addiction, but you're probably going to sell drugs because you don't have any way to make money. So that's all I'm saying. Does that make sense, Sabe Kun? Oh, okay. So what does she say? I heard a doctor say on Facebook, most of the pharmaceutical companies are all businesses now. Yeah, I know. Most people don't need meds to feel better. Well, I mean, I don't want to go that far either. I just want to say it's a judgment call, right? So if, if that claim is literally based on data, right, that most people don't need them, um, yeah, I mean, that doesn't surprise me. But since I don't have the data, I'm not going to make a claim. I'm just going to say that it doesn't make any sense, right? It's not common sense to think that you can put somebody right back into the old neighborhood that they got arrested for drugs and they won't and give them, you know, a drug so they won't get addicted and somehow their life will just be peachy clean. <laughs> really? Does that make, does somebody understand how you could be that ignorant? I mean, the, re the reason he's that ignorant is he doesn't identify with any of these people. Right, exactly. He, he creates the drug and he looks at its effect on the brain, but he doesn't think at all about who's going to take it. And he doesn't think about the profit motive behind the people who are going to sell it. And he doesn't think about the profit motive behind the people who are going to prescribe it. He just doesn't think about the human context. That's why you need to combine science with humanities. Does that make sense? Makes sense. <laughs> and professor, adding to that, um, the medicine part, um, that specific doctor, he said, uh, he, he pointed out an example that when people have the common cold and whatnot, people are getting antibiotics when they can naturally um, develop immunity in four or five days if they're healthy, but doctors still go out of their ways to prescribe antibiotics when they don't necessarily need those medicines. So he said that this uh, in turn eventually will cause your immune system to degrade. And in the future, especially in old age, you can have high risks of heart attack and other vascular cardiovascular diseases. And it kind of made sense to me because I do see around um, uh, the people around me, especially kids, when I was a kid and I compared to them, uh, to their childhood, and I see I took far less medicines to um, get better from sicknesses, where, whereas uh, the kids around me these days, um, they, they get all sorts of medicines for their illnesses. And it's just that either they do need more medicines these days because we are more isolated um, as families, and we're not um, uh, like a typical community as with, uh, like we would be back in the days. Um, so maybe because they are, because of the lack of exposure, um, uh, lack of going outside and having the exercise or playing around is contributing to lower, um, to higher health issues in children, maybe that, or maybe they really don't need that many medicines. Yeah, that, that's just my take on this. Well, it's become controversial. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, especially for the opioids and pain. Um, 
But really, addiction, depression, pain, I mean, how arrogant can you get? But anyway, what I'm getting, I guess I just wanted to confirm with Aurora that, I mean, Aurora, you do nice reports. I just want to make sure that in your mind you were thinking, yeah, this is true. So can you think of an example of somebody? Here's another thing for those of you who um, maybe didn't come as prepared. Do you know people who are really smart, like they get straight A's in high school? Guys, especially, I'm sorry. Um, but they really are mean to women. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and they're really immature when it comes to women. And they really ask true. women to sleep with them without thinking about the, the woman's, what, what it might cost her. Or if she rejects him and he's like the straight A guy, he gets really jealous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's a story about Apollo. He's really nasty to the women that he goes after. And he goes after these young nymphs that he doesn't respect at all. But boy, if they reject him, he is really nasty. <laughs> so so uh, if any of you can think of examples like that, or if he's really smart, but he doesn't have any conscience about what kind of job he might get, right? He just wants to make money. And so, you know, he'll go work for a company that fossil fuel company, you know, without any second thought or a company that sells uh, products that really damage women or he just, it, it's not, part of his worldview what he wants is to be successful and he has all the capabilities to become the ceo and so he gets a job to move up and trades in his wife for a younger model every 10 to 15 years and makes it and provides jobs and he's mr successful um so aurora can you think of any people like that Most, okay, what did she say? <laughs> what did, did Aurora say something? Most make toppers from high school were total jerks. Um, does that mean, what is a male topper? Does that mean the kids at the top of the grade, whatever? Yeah, yeah, that's how we refer to them, the toppers in class. So the, the male, the dudes were always just straight up weird. Okay. All right. Um, so that's Mr. Damasio. I He might be a nice guy. I think he is a nice guy. But even if that he's just nice by habit, he doesn't realize what he's telling people. Somebody who is a lot more wicked than him would totally agree with them. Does that... Everybody understand that? That was the same with John Stuart Mill, the same with Kant. These people had good intentions and then other people really messed it up. <laughs> Does that, everybody kind of get that? We keep doing the same stupid things. Um, okay, Masoma, did you have a reaction? Uh, yes, Professor. Um... Professor, my reaction was about the same thing that uh, Aurora pointed out about. Uh, I mean, I really like that you pointed out in, in this uh, book that you, uh, before uh, uh, Demosio think about, uh, you know, about creating distraction, uh, he should think about the consequence of this and, and he should think about a complete system that, uh, you know, uh, that apply and, and how uh, they introduce uh, this drug into the public because it can be corrupted, it can be misused. And uh, I mean, uh, I, I also didn't find it very convincing when Daimosas, I mean, uh, he was saying that, you know, this drug is helpful and uh, I'm not very sure about this, uh, that every time it's useful. Uh, and then, yeah, there are other ways, uh, I mean, consult, 
I mean, there are other therapies, right? So I, I'm not really sure or like supporting the use of drag. And then, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, last time uh, one student, I think Nochat was mentioning about like how psychologists in Bangladesh using the drugs and, and making their patients more depression because they, they, they go to sleep and then, you know, they, they uh, uh, yeah, I think, uh, this can be corrupted and people can be misuse it because they don't have any patient and then they're using this drug so that they become worse and they, then they approach again to the, the psychologist and uh, i think yeah this is very dangerous idea and before creating something we need to think about the consequence we need to think that if we, if we have a good system that can be applied i mean uh, that can apply this drug in a in a uh, a better way that flourish uh, the human life and not to corrupt it. So I think this is very important. And Can you understand how this would be utilitarians who emphasized, you know, pleasure, pain on a very animalistic scale. They thought that if they could have these drugs that would, you know, create dopamine, serotonin, whatever, that then they could increase happiness. And it, it's just, it was too naive. Does that make sense, Masoma? Uh, yes, yeah, Professor. I, I think, Professor, you know, the point is when we are talking about the consequence and when we are saying that, but the problem is like, sometimes we cannot analyze it correctly. So we, we can say that, okay, the consequence is good because people get happy. They can use this track and then they get out of, you know, this loneliness. And when they get this crack, they feel good. But then we don't, uh, we cannot really analyze that in the long run, maybe this effect, if, effect is even worse or sometimes we cannot see this consequence in the long run and and that's why we make this decision i think uh, you know it's very very complicated thing so i think yeah it needs more uh thoughts and reason and thinking like before mm -hmm. deciding yeah. so again if if you haven't started your research paper yet i think you know this will give you a lot of ideas right uh, yes yeah so, yeah it does Okay, now did you have a reaction? No, Professor. I just read that and then I didn't really catch that. So I just understand what uh, when the Aurora explained and the, the Professor, uh, when you uh, you guys discuss. So I, I catch more later, I feel like. Do you have any examples like from your country or? your family or just something that you know other people wouldn't think of that as an example? Uh, which one, Professor? Of just a person who loves Apollo, but he's immature mm -hmm. with women or he doesn't care about justice. So he uses his intellectual skills just to make money, oh. just to have power. I'm not sure with that, Professor. Maybe because there are so many different kind of people in our country. But for uh, my environment, uh, I feel like we don't have that. Yeah. Um, okay, so in your country, right? Myanmar? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so would you say that the political leaders are really smart in that they give these no. that? Oh, I mean, do they give speeches in terms of knowing exactly how to use rhetoric to uh, persuade the masses? I mean, you have to be smart if you're going to be really good about manipulating people, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, so that would be one example, right, of somebody yeah. who is smart. Oh, Professor, but... can I? Sure, Pooja. Oh, no, because I'm waiting. Uh, sorry. So... Uh, what Masoma said is similar to that uh, is my uh, topic of discussion for now. So I was uh, trying to uh, talk about the impact of antidepressant drugs on human flourishing and the uh, psychological uh, mental health situation in Nepal. Uh, and when uh, they say at the end of the chapter eight book is like one must always should have hope and this uh, 
made me realize that the relationship between neuroscience and the brain of uh, brain mind connections and the their worst scenarios and the worst abuse that can occur so i i uh, before two three days i saw a post and i shared that post in my wall of facebook so what does it says is like when you have uh, the anxiety depression and mental illness is increasing a lot especially during the pandemic situation so what my i mean like i don't want to be specific to my country but it can be in many countries so what people in my country most of the people in my country says like when uh, you have some illness so it is not about like uh, when it comes to mental illness specifically so people says like when you have like mental illness don't go to psychiatrist but like uh, the alternative approach they adopt is like have weed and it will go okay do meditate it will go or like be wild and do something very enjoyable but like when it comes to like the person who is suffering from that mental illness we can't describe the situations of that and like what he is going but like we try to give a lot of alternative way so that he or she can feel good okay and it really and when it comes to other diseases we always says like go hospital and treat soon but when it comes to like mental illness or like psychological disorder we don't say like uh, go and the street they will just ask us to okay meditate have yoga and everything so it does not make me sense so i would uh, like to discuss more about it so i want to relate the chapter 8 last paragraph with uh my post that i have shared in my facebook wall and that made me realize like we can connect in that way too but like the the depression is related to a psychological disorder i mean a mental disorder so that sorts of uh, thing i want to highlight thank you professor sure um but then mental disorder i mean yeah you can't separate it from actually not being able to understand your situation very well like your thought um so you you have a mental disorder it might be that you're deluded or i mean like you think you're a worse person than you are or you think you're a better person than you know all sorts of mental disorders right uh yeah professor some if someone is like having headache and he is going some uh, suffering from some uh like a tension or a depression we don't say like go and uh, take medicines what your psychologist or psychiatrist uh refer to you but like we will say go and have pills i mean like the uh uh if someone is having a lot of headache because of something that he, he is going through we won't say like go and have medicines from the psychiatrist he will tell you something better we will say like go and have painkiller because it will work it's just a like a headache so it doesn't make me sense someone is going through some other problem his mind is not working in a proper way and we say like go and have a painkiller and it is like uh, i don't know what term should i use but like it doesn't makes me make me sense and like comparing to other developed country and uh, people when it comes to like a mental problem or like a, if people is suffering from headache they will try to go and counsel from their psychologist or psychiatrist but here we will just say like go and have pain killer it will just go you don't need to go doctors and check up and that's why i was like trying to connect it with the chapter as well yeah okay i um i'm not sure if i caught all of that but i I just think um we can value we can look at drugs as self too much we can value them too much we can value them too little right um and then uh, professor yeah i want to say something like pooja said that why they don't uh, go any doctor because of uh headache uh, i think at first they thought about money like if he's a simple headache uh, and then she or he goes to the 
doctor than uh, for them like uh, it's uh, the money is just waste for them so i think that's why at first they didn't go to the doctor they thought if pain cooler works so it's okay and my money won't waste yeah okay yeah, that's that's another, yeah. Um, let me make sure everybody let's see diana did you want to say something because it's fine with me if people just you know say they want to say something i just want to make sure everybody's got hello me. professor yeah. good morning everyone yeah. am i clear because today i'm using data i'm not sure you're clear at the moment whoops the quality of my internet i think when i was reading there i could i read it and on there i uh, i was very focused on the mind oh we lost you you're sort of in and out diana do you want to type and something then in the main uh, part of the by mind the body is functioning and yes professor i will type it okay Okay, and Sabe Kun said, uh, people that are highly skilled in certain parts of science or too scientific tend to be oblivious to the world issues around them, especially social issues. Much like a storm, it's quiet at the center and absolute chaos outside of it. These people tend to be at the center of these storms. They may not be aware of the effects their cut and dried research findings have on society. Um, is the psychology entirely separate from the body? Okay. Well, I mean, I'll tell you, when I go into the building where the psychology department is, it's with the sciences and math, right? And then here are these rooms where they do these surveys. It's so clinical. It's so, you know, you just, it's just natural for people not to tell you what they really think, you know, because it's all objective and detached. So you, you're not going to be yourself. And they're going to ask you these questions and they're just, you know, I mean, you read books written about child psychology, about how to deal with the baby. And you, you look at the author as a guy and you say, he's never spent. 48 hours in a row with the baby like he doesn't know you know he doesn't know anything <laughs> and yeah I mean famous quote I used to have six theories and no kids now I have six kids and no theories you know and that's just where Aristotle says it's a judgment call right you have to decide in a situation but there are better and worse ways to decide and you have to read Greek tragedy and you have to read history and you have to read, you know, poetry. These are the things that get you to start understanding your inner life and your emotions and the mistakes we kind of make and, you know, sort of put some flesh on those theories. Um, so I do think we could have the best possible education if we figure out how to combine all the all the tools, we have a lot of tools in the toolbox, right? And um, that's what I want you to come up with. I really want each of you to come up with your own sort of vision of how to combine all the different disciplines and the ways you're trained to think and how you could put them together, not only to have a healthy psyche yourself, but to make a contribution to the society, right? Uh, friendships are so important. So how do you cultivate, you know, friendships that really will keep you focused and keep you, keep your emotions and your actions and your thoughts sort of in sync? Um, and I'm going to let, you know, I'm going to take a break right now. And then afterwards, um, if somebody wants to like say something after the break right away, go ahead. Otherwise, I'll... I have my little pictures of the little Greek gods and goddesses, and I can sort of go through them. Um, let's see. Pooja, 
So Sabe Kun is saying a headache and depression are very different health issues. What works for a headache can as well go away with some sleep or prescription glasses or whatever. <laughs> May not be applicable to depression, not entirely. Uh, I personally agree the way depression is being treated, it can only be controlled by meds is um, businessy, somebody's making money. I tend to think mental health are multifactional, it's not just brain chemicals. I, and I also think, um, too reminds me of Anthropocene, but you also need to think that you have to see, is this another kind of colonialism, right? Is it colonizing your mind? Are these people coming and convincing you that this is why you're depressed and I have the cure, right? It's, I don't, I'm suspicious of colonialism, right? Suspicious of this Western superiority complex and they're superior because of their science, right? So it doesn't mean it's wrong and I wouldn't ever want anybody not to take it. It's just that Damasio presents it in a, such a simplistic way. It's just shocking. And then he says, you know, the golden rule, it's built in our biology. Oh, like nobody's ever thought of this before, right? Oh, come on. I mean, maybe nobody's had the billion dollars worth of machinery to, to measure it and go, oh, oh, there's a piece of data. I couldn't possibly think anything without some data point, you know? That's it, annoying because again, somebody's making a ton of money on all this machinery that you have to use to get on people's heads and check out their maps and all that stuff. And you know, I just think a lot of it's plain old common sense or, you know, the wisdom gained from experience that he's never had these experiences. So he has to find it out the expensive way. Um, but anyway, his friends probably make a lot of money. <laughs> um, uh, nowadays, it seems to be dictating. Yeah, at first data was used to facilitate our thinking and now it seems to be dictating. I had that article, remember on Kant? That the, uh, you could go back and check that post on Kant and it has an article about that, that we're making ourselves into extensions of a machine. But again, you could do research and find more articles. I really, <laughs> I tell students to go find this stuff and then I steal it and I use it the next time I teach the class. So, hey guys, I need to supplement my class reading. So go, go for it. All right, I'm gonna give you a pause. I have 15 after the hour. We can pause till 30 minutes after the hour. And if you want to do your post, you know, write pretty much everything you put on your post, then you get you get to get it over with a lot quicker. Okay. All right. So here I have Damasio's book. Here I have the book reviews. Uh, San Francisco, these are brave book reviews, right? San Francisco Chronicle, Los Angeles Times, New York Times, Nature, uh, San Jose. Discover, Prospect, New Humanist, New Scientist, Publishers Weekly, The Guardian in London, um, The Financial Times, The Irish Times. And then he has, um, he has a Nobel laureate from Harvard University, a Nobel, another Nobel laureate from Columbia, uh, a theater and film director, um, it's just Harvard, another Harvard. So there is an intellectual elite, right? That really thinks, ah, you hit the spot, right? And to me, this is the product of a person in the intellectual elite. Does that make sense to people? Just doesn't get it. And so... You know, he's thinking of his emotions in relation to his family, 
he's not thinking at all about what it might mean to be poor or desperate or abused or non-white or a woman or nothing. You know, he has his imagination. He has an impoverished imagination. Um, and then here's another book called Excellent Sheep. And this is um, about how in the elite universities in the US, uh, the competition is unbelievable. And the students don't want to get anything below an A minus. And they drive themselves absolutely crazy. And in order to get into Harvard or something, you have to have straight A's, 11 not, you know, co-curricular activities, you know, up the kazoo scores and all these tests. And he says underneath that, the kids are depressed, right? And they're anxious. They're not psychologically healthy and it's not helping our country. It's destroying democracy because all the people who go on to take these positions, especially in like Wall Street, their only motive is money or status or power. They have no idea how to just how to create a middle class. And like they're just completely caught up in this culture. Um, okay, Diana, go ahead. Oh, I guess you'll have to type it. Okay. Did she ask what the name of the person was? Um, anyway, so, so, um, and, and their mental health. Okay. Do I think today's people are in good mental health all over the world? I don't know. You know, Diana, I would never answer that question. Um, I just, I went through a few things in life and the Greek archetypes just literally came into my mind. But what I really learned was what, what if I were poor? What if I were in a poor country? What if I were um, not white? What if I didn't have parents who basically supported me? What if I didn't, I mean, I just, it made me so aware of how vulnerable people are, and then also how strong so many people are, right? And so, like, I know that I don't know, right? Um, and I know that privileged people like Mr. Damasio, they don't know either, right? And so we really have to get someone who has a lot of empathy and a lot of training and again, I think that AUW students are a good cohort of women who've grown up. They know, they, they know about discrimination, they know about poverty, they know about uh, resilience, right? Strength of mind. Um, yeah, none, yeah, there's lots of stuff. But um, I just, I would trust their judgment on a lot of things better than I would trust somebody like Mr. Damasio. Um, uh, let's see, I had something else I was gonna bring up. Oh yeah, my son, okay. So everything about the, the culture we have is that science and technology create problems and then they create solutions to the problems they created instead of preventing things, right? So our healthcare system in the US, at least three quarters of it is unnecessary, okay? Because it's based on corporations. Uh, okay, so food corporations make a lot of money putting corn syrup in their food because it's addictive and people will buy it. And so there's a brain chemistry for that, right? Uh, I read a whole book, The Hacking of the American Mind. He hates sugar. Just get off sugar. It's an addiction. It's your brain chemistry gets all messed up if you eat sugar. Um, but 
the corporations that sell you stuff with sugar are making a ton of money and you're getting diabetes and heart disease, but you're also getting these mood swings. Like, you you know, you can't focus your mind. So you're much more likely not to be able to handle life very well. So then you might get depressed, right? You don't have that just calmness of mind, right? The Greeks called it sophrosune, which is just calmness of mind, the ability to stay focused in a situation. And, but you have to train yourself to do that. And it does involve a sound mind and a sound body and a decent diet and exercise. You know, all that stuff works together. But the other thing is that, yeah, I mean, in my country, the amount of money that's spent in healthcare because of obesity, diabetes, uh, heart disease, hip replacements and, and uh, knee replacements because people are obese and they don't exercise, um, uh, obsession with sports and the kids get all these sports related injuries because they're going too far, right? It's not a wellness kind of sport attitude towards sports. And um, I mean, you just go on and on. And then there's depression. Well, you tell people they can have anything you want and you give them this whole fantasy and life hits and they get depressed. Well, hey, <laughs> how much of that is that you have the wrong idea in your head and it does trigger chemistry, I mean, no question. But how are you going to get over it? A pill or changing your idea or some combination of those? Well, then my son, um, I had a, a colleague who did research on endocrine disruptors. So there's a lot of research about plastic. When you put your food in plastic, it leaches out these chemicals that actually disrupt your endocrine system. So my son got neuroendocrine cancer. So, you know, he's just allergic to this, this, you know, high tech, high plastic world. That's what he's, that's what it's a response to. But they have this new drug, you know, to cure endocrine cancer because, hey, there is a lot of it around. So let's make a drug and make money. And oh, she's so. Yeah, and my grandson took a lot of antibiotics when he was little. Every time I visited them, he was on antibiotic. Now he has a lot of allergies. He has a wheezer. And I've heard that if it gets bad enough, they literally have to have a, a intestinal replacement because their, their intestines, the, the stuffy all those microbes or all that bacteria that you need to digest food has been killed off by antibiotics so much that your body can't produce that. So you have another form of surgery you know, that we've never had before. And so it's, it's within that backdrop, right? That Mr. Damasio is speaking. And he, this is, these are the people that have all the honor, right? All the status, all the money. Um, yeah, so here's, that's his book. And this is my little book, right? <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm nobody, but that's okay. Because if I had a reputation, people would read it and they would just trash me, right? And I don't think they would have very good reasons. The ultimate reason is, I haven't had this experience. I don't know what you're talking about. You're making me look bad. You know, I really think a lot of it is faith, a blind faith in science and technology to save us. But they, they don't, certainly they don't think that because they have all their data, right? But they forget that we have minds. We have an idea of the good or an idea of a black sheep or an idea you know we have ideas and they drive us um and they affect our ability to have a healthy psyche so um one thing okay 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 here we go i'll read this saida 
One thing I don't like about it is that I see a lot of people picking up on the people who try to say they're depressed. If you laugh all day, have fun, cook and stuff, how are you sad or depressed? How are you posting stuff and saying you're, because no one posts on media, do stuff all day and are depressed. No one who posts on media as if every person has to be crying all day to claim they're depressed. It's not how it goes. It's not how it goes. Uh, people have their own doings of, of how they stay during the period. Uh, some people might stay in bed all day. Some might make themselves busy all day just to escape their thoughts. They might be depressed all night or when they're on their own. Um, okay, so again, um, I don't want to underplay any aspect of it that is science or social science, but ultimately, when you go to bed at night, right? So it's the inner dialogue of the soul with itself. And, um, and when you, your dreams tell you stuff about your psyche. So yeah, I'm the ancients, you know, focused on this inner dialogue and trying to break the chain. And then they focused on dreams. What are your dreams telling you about yourself? They focus on the unconscious, the stuff you need to flush out, which, um, you know, it's not a silver bullet, but Damasio says nothing about it. Damasio has the blank slate view. And okay, I hope everybody understands that. And so if he fails, if his drugs fail, there must be a genetic reason <laughs> because the drug itself, you know, if it's a blank slate and you add this drug, it should be peachy keen. Like he doesn't consider enough the influence of environment. Um, and then he would attribute any problem to genetics, right? Um, anyway. So let me just go with this throwing the Greeks at you, partly to make you aware of how much we've destroyed that. This has no respect, right? The scientists would never go for this. Um, the thing that is really interesting, though, is that students go for it. I, when I wrote my book, um, I was, you know, in my mid forties, I never thought about this, the goddesses of ancient Greek, you know, in my life. I didn't think about that in college. As a matter of fact, I probably would have thought about it less than almost anybody else because I didn't have a lot of friends. The ones I had was very, you know, compatible and, and were also completely out of the loops. I didn't understand personality types. I, I was a sucker, right? I married the wrong person because I had no idea what character he had because I never thought about character, right? I just sort of, you know, took him at face value. Whereas people who, you know, are much more people oriented, you know, would, would probably have a few more things to say. But anyway, so, um, Let's see, I can't remember where I was going with that. That, um, anyway, I'm going to just give you the, um, the different gods and goddesses and give you a sense of um, that the claim here is that we're not a blank slate. So Mr. Damasio says we're not a blank slate. Yay, I agree. And the stuff has evolved over time. Yay, I agree. And then he talks about the digestive system, the circulatory system. And then he talks about images in the imagination. But all he talks about is like digestion. <laughs> he doesn't realize that those myths are trying to trigger these deep primitive instincts and get, get us to be consciously aware of them so we can understand, you know, where those impulses really are 
and then try to gradually integrate them, have integrity, right? So when you have dreams, right? You might have dreams of um, revenge dreams, or you might have um, fear dreams, anxiety dreams. They tell you about those deep things that are affecting you, but you keep pressing it down. Um, I think a lot of AUW students be part, I mean, the stress, there's tons of stress, but you also don't get a lot of time to process it either, right? So not having enough time to just sit and reflect, or again, that's the kind of person I am anyway, but, or, if you're extroverted, it would be time to talk to friends, right? So you can, again, bring this into some kind of public venue and just say what you're really feeling or, right? And so that itself, just keeping pushing it down is going to make for bad chemistry, right? Um, so the stress response is a physiological response and it does break down your um, immune system. I mean, it's all measured. And I, in another class, I teach a woman who went through that and she is a scientist and she realized that she needed um, that religion, just like Mr. Damasio, those stories actually had a function. <laughs> for helping you fun, uh, deal with life. She ended up going to Greece, of course, <laughs> Crete, and uh, yeah, settling down, you know, reducing her stress by hiking outside, right? So having a connection to the natural world, like you were saying, Sabe Kohn, the andro Anthropocene or something, I mean, no. We can't reinvent ourselves. We're just going to get sicker and sicker. But, you know, again, science, technology, all these intellectuals, oh, we're just going to totally restructure everything. I don't think so, right? Um, there's a sense in which we're having to bioengineer nature, but that's not, that's not, the, I don't think that's a very healthy direction to go in. Again, I don't think science is going to save us. I, I'm not against it, but to think that it's a silver bullet, I think is really a mistake. Does that make sense, Sabe Kun? There aren't any silver bullets. Life is complicated. So let me do the Greek gods just to give you, and goddesses, to give you an idea of how dang complicated it is, right? I, I mean, I guess you read about that, but I'll just you know, do it for fun, because you get to look at pictures. You get to stimulate a different part of your brain here. Um, all right, uh, Zeus, the god of justice. So with Damasio, the question is, hey, Mr. Damasio, you know how powerful these drugs are. You know their effect on the brain. You should be scared, excuse me, shitless about what could happen if this stuff gets released into society, right? He should have known that. These guys should have known that. They should have been really aware of how incredibly dangerous and potentially corrupted the influence could be. And the fact that he thinks we can get rid of all these horrible things in 20 years or less permanently. <laughs> Just, I don't know. I hope all of you understand how profoundly ignorant that is and how many reviewers just rave about it, right? So it's not, he's not isolated. This whole elite really believes that. That's, <laughs> oh my gosh. I know that I, you know, I have no status. I'm nobody. I'm like Socrates, right? The the stone cutter. But I am sort of like, really, guys, really. So um, yeah, they should have known right away that there have to be laws 
regulating, closely regulating, first of all, the companies that make this stuff, because if you don't really be careful, they're going to go for the billions of bucks, which is exactly what the Sackler family did. And if you want to do research on the Sackler family, S-A-C-K-L-E-R, they were they own the company that made the worst opioid, the one that's the most notorious. They knew it was addictive. They made billions of bucks that they put in Swiss banks because they thought eventually this might catch up with them. Like they knew this. And now they, they have been sued by a number of states because the states are showing material evidence that it's costing the states all this money to deal with the addiction problems. And they're getting these really awful lawyers that are just finding every loophole in the system. Like they have no qualms about this, no regrets. <laughs> I guess maybe they gave, you know, 30 million or something to some wonderful charity. I mean, they, they gave just peanuts to make it look good, like they care. And it, it's so bad if you want to read that. But Mr. Damasio should have known that, right? Does everybody, I'm not expecting him to be a neuroscientist, right? I'm expecting him to just know something that any old common sense person would know, right? You got to regulate those corporations. They've got to report in, right? Really have good records of who are you selling this to? Are they legitimate licensed practitioners? Then you have to have all sorts of regulations on how do you get a license to prescribe it, right? Because again, that could get easily corrupted. You could, you know, everybody in town finds the doctor who will give you opioids for your headache or whatever. And then the doctor profits because he gets more patients. So, I mean, you have to regulate the doctors or the psychologists or therapists or psychiatrists. You have to have strict regulations and strict um, monitoring of those regulations, right? There should be a federal one of the federal agencies, the Food and Drug Administration, you've, the Damasio and his buddies should have said, the Food and Drug Administration needs to have a whole branch of regulators who make sure these laws get enforced. Then, um, then there needed to be strict punishment of people who were suspected, right? You have to find who is selling these things to their buddies, right? So, I mean, I had college students who told me they could walk into a doctor's office, say they have a headache, get an opioid prescription and sell it to other college students and make a ton of money. It was really passed out like candy, you know? like birth control pills or something. It was not ready at all very well regulated. Probably still isn't. But anyway, um, I'm just saying Mr. Damasio is responsible. Is anyone going to make him legally responsible or his friends? No, because they're still in that mindset. You know, I don't make judgments, right? Sabe Kun, the whole social science thing. Like we're just objective and detached. We just make this product. We don't make judgments. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, and then, so that, that would be the justice part. Um, Athena is the goddess. She's even wiser. She's wiser than her dad uh, for lots of reasons, but not related to this. Uh, Poseidon. Okay, so the issue with Poseidon and Demeter, these are the male and female of natural forces. So if you mess with Poseidon, if you, okay, 
if you mess with Demeter, goddess of fertility, she's going to make the earth barren. <laughs> okay. So we're messing with Demeter and we're, the earth is becoming barren. Oh, that's arrogance. And Poseidon, you mess, you mess with the natural cycles. Poseidon gets the winds to blow and he gets the floods and the hurricanes, he, you know, and he controls uh, the sources of clean water. Hello. <laughs> right. And so my issue there was all of these resources, all this money is going into neuroscience research. Mark Zuckerman, the head of Facebook, of all things gave a ton of money to neuroscience research, you know, and then it doesn't go to sustainability, right? Because I hope you understand that, right? The money goes here, the money goes there. So these guys are getting all the money. Uh, but the other thing is, um, yeah, just think about this. Think about this for a minute. Zuckerman's wife is a doctor. I think she's a pediatrician. So Zuckerman and his wife decide to give a buttload of money to neuroscience, right? What's the premise there? Well, we can develop these drugs and therapies to rewire the brain. <laughs> but then his Facebook thing <laughs> is rewiring the brain, right? Through, through the software, through these Facebook posts and social media is rewiring the brain, but it's making people really sick. <laughs> and right, unwise, the opposite is creating anxiety and all this stuff. But then he goes and gives money to neuroscience because we're going to get these drugs. That <laughs> oh, God, does everybody understand that this is really nuts? So the Facebook side is, is what's replaced the humanities, right? Instead of reading history, or philosophy, or or literature, or poetry, and in, in, in a instead of developing that part of you, like your emotions and your reflective capacity, Facebook just you know, I have all these opinions, and then somebody else comes back at me, and maybe I create a brand and create this wall between myself, and I never have to know myself. I'm just my brand. Or I'm just, you know, I'm the opposite of finding the mean between extremes. I'm in a completely passive emotional and intellectual place, zone. And this is going to disrupt you. This is going to make you unhealthy. And then Zuckerberg, oh, well, you could just take some, you know, some of these drugs, right? Antidepressants or something. Oh. Okay, so the next one is that Mr. Damasio thinks his legacy, the legacy of these drugs, is that it will change the human playing field. We will, we will get rid of addiction, pain, violence, and depression within 20 years or less, which is right now, guys. Have we gotten rid of these things? Have, have opioids helped us to get rid of these things? So he is completely misjudged his legacy, right? I don't even, I'm not even sure he thinks so. However, <laughs> I think he probably thinks the legacy of these drugs is gonna be so positive. Even when, right, we have all this addiction, he'll just say, well, that's not my responsibility, right? My legacy is that, you know, we, we cured depression and all this stuff, as long as people know how to use it, no problem. And he doesn't think it'll be part of his legacy to be that ignorant, right? Um, Apollo, here he is. Yes, Mr. Damasio, you think you're so hot. But he, Apollo had music, just like Mr. Damasio says, that the road to salvation is... Um, the contemplation of nature, well, that's nice. That's what, you know, your average nature lover would say. Um, 
the marveling at scientific investigations, you know, just stepping back and seeing how amazing people are and um, appreciating the arts, right? Well, I mean, I can just picture him listening to classical music, right? Because Apollo likes this very ordered, actually J.S. Bach would be the classical Apollonian, but he listens to it with his buddies or it's, to me, it's an isolated situation. It's kind of appreciation of the arts that privileged people can do because they have the time and their and they're, other things aren't bothering them that much, right? Um, they have privilege, they have leisure time, and they don't have that much to worry about. So they can appreciate the arts. Like, ah. And um, so what I would like to know, because I know a lot of people in philosophy, a lot of them are Apollos, and they're not very emotionally mature or sophisticated. Um, they might be decent spouses, and conscientious parents, but they're not sophisticated about the complexity of life because the discipline itself attracts people that don't want to go there. It's too messy. Everybody's irrational, right? So it attracts people who don't want to go there. Um, but at best, they might order their own lives that way. It's just that, for example, what about rap music? This one philosopher was reading a paper and she was dissing rap music you know because well it's not very Apollonian well what is it I had some students write papers on it and the NPR public radio has had a long had a long series about it first of all it started out being um, the idea of one of these guys black star his mother was an anthropologist in, in, in African tribes, there was the one, the person called the storyteller. And in Greek, uh, in all those ancient uh, cultures, the way to have history is you had one person who kept telling the story, right? Because it had to be oral history. And so he, rap music was a modern Afri African-American, uh, art form that was telling the story of African Americans, right? Because it wasn't getting published. And, and it was genius, right? It was great. And then it got corrupted by money and power and stuff. But every art form does, like, why do they get blamed? Um, but the original purpose of it is great. Plus, it's making people conscious of the kind of lousy society, right? It's forcing Americans to look at the dark side of our society and stop idealizing us, right? We're the science society. Oh, come on. We're a lot of stuff. And so it's flushing out the dark side, which is what art should do. It should say, hey, buddy, <laughs> you're not that good. Uh, and there, it's expressing, like, we have a society where we have we have oppressed people to the point where this is how they express how they feel. And it's a natural feeling given their situation. And so I, I like rap music, um, but the rappers themselves get really disappointed when some of them just go for the sex. They want to make money. So it becomes sex and aggressive sex because that sells, right? Plus you have these stereotypes about black men, so you can really sell it. Um, and the rappers that wanted it to be this history are really, really, you know, unhappy about it. So there's raps about that, right? <laughs> but that's, you know, that's a self-correcting system. So, then more recently, they have rap music coming from prisons. So prisoners are creating this music. Again, we need to know the kind of culture that's going on in our prisons. Uh, we have more people in prison than any other country per capita. I mean, our system is disgusting. But, you know, that is very educational to hear 
the feelings, you know, to hear the stories of those guys in prison. And I think it's great art, personally. <laughs> but, you know, your average Damasio wouldn't sit and listen to rap music in his spare time, right? Does everybody understand that? Because it's not, it's not rational. Well, but it's human, you know? Uh, anyway, so that's Apollo. And then his counterpart is Artemis, the goddess of the hunt. And I couldn't find it in this chapter. Maybe I just keep, maybe I forgot to put it in, but from her point of view, she would be a nature lover. And she's the one that would be the environmentalist. She loves animals. She would, you know, Artemis types are the types that, well, Greta Thunberg, you know, the ones that are protecting nature, trying to get back to nature. They're um, involved in animal protection. And they get mad <laughs> at men. They, she doesn't want anything to do with her brother, who's the big city guy, right? reason the Apollonian thing builds cities and you know societies and all that other stuff and then there's Artemis the nature lover well an Artemis type wouldn't want to take those drugs because they're not natural right an Artemis type might want to take herbs or something when really maybe she should right she's going to overreact the other way so, Mr. Damasio, your drugs can't save anybody if they refuse to take them, right? He doesn't think about that. Oh, well, people are so irrational. Well, wait a sec, Mr. Damasio. She's not entirely wrong either, right? That's what I'm trying to say is that on the one hand, if, you're, if you go too far with refusing to have any, anything but natural remedies, that's too far. But he's on the other extreme, and so he doesn't understand that. Um, then there's Ares and Hera. Those are the god and goddess of honor. And Ares was the god of war because that was what was honored in the time when um, this kind of war was big. But actually, nowadays, the economic war is the big war or cyber war, right? It's not traditional war. But in the economic war, um, I mean, really, the, a lot of these corporations are involved in economic war, right? They want to make money and they compete against each other. And that, that has, you know, made the opioid crisis worse. Um, and Damasio doesn't think about that, right? The, the, um, you just, the, the main thing is that our society honors neuroscientists more than they deserve. It doesn't honor therapists that try to do family therapy and work with families or relationship therapy or there's, I don't, I heard about another one that's dialectical relation, dialectical therapy. I don't know. There's just, well, Jungian therapy, that's what I like, obviously, archetypal therapy. But um, I, my claim is just that he's honored more than he deserves. And the neuroscience is honored more than it deserves. Um, let's see, Dionysus. This one was, Dionysus is about, at the theater, magnifying all of these irrational passions and flushing them out. And that's where Spinoza doesn't do that. Spinoza, you try to talk yourself into changing your neural maps. I, you know, those of you who read the chapter, I think the second chapter, I quoted from Spinoza and every page of his ethics is like that. So you take every emotion, you examine it. It's actually very passive. It makes you unhappy. Uh, pride, because pride is passive because it's based on outside, things outside your control. Okay, You can't get status other than from other people. And that varies a lot. And you have to change yourself to please other people. So forget it. 
and then turn toward, you know, you release yourself from that need and you just focus on the intellectual love of God, that we live in this natural world and just loving that fact and living according to this knowledge and just um, appreciating, right? The beauty of scientific exploration, um, the beauty of the arts, but it, he doesn't mean like tragedy. <laughs> He means, you know, listening to nice music and uh, appreciating visual beauty. I mean, I'm not against that, but um, I don't think he's thinking about the Greek view of the Iliad, the Odyssey. Oh my gosh, all these people are doing all these rotten things. And it's trying to give you this imagination where you know that life is complicated. So that's how tragedy works. Um, and Damasio doesn't get that at all. And then Aphrodite. So this is the pleasure. Um, you know, obviously he knew these drugs trigger an intense pleasure. That's what makes them dangerous. And the whole, the whole history of humanity is that pleasure it is a is dangerous and it leads also to greed because if you really seek pleasure you gotta have money and then greed destroys societies so Damasio didn't consider that he he didn't consider oh Hephaestus uh Hestia is the one that that identifies patterns so I like that's me right I have I I interpret the Greeks as having identified patterns. And so I write about these patterns and how they play out in Damasio's, how, what he's not thinking of. And then Hermes is the messenger of the gods. So Apollo um, invents some great thing and then Hermes deliver, de delivers it from the gods to the humans, right? And so Hermes has delivered this uh, miracle drug. And um, Hermes is also a trickster <laughs> and a liar and a deceiver. <laughs> so there are stories where Apollo, this isn't the first time, Apollo creates some other great thing and everybody, and he thinks he's going to save the world. And then it gets handed down to people. And oh my God, it goes. It uh, doesn't work out the way they thought. So yeah, 2,500, 3,000 years ago, people thought about stuff like this. And uh, Mr. Damasio doesn't get it. Um, so it does show also the fact that people are not getting a balanced education. Um, they're not, I, I do believe in liberal arts education, I must say. But I think a lot of the teachers, they don't teach it with this sort of background that you're trying to get people to understand other people, to have common, to have empathy. Um, so like John Stuart Mill wanted to base a whole culture on empathy, but he did it in this context of a blank slate and pleasure and pain. <laughs> Whereas the Greeks wanted empathy, but they did it in this context of telling all these stories about how people get obsessed about something that's sacred, right? Justice, in the name of justice, they harm each other, or in the name of justice, they ignore each other. And so that's what Mr. Damasio does, right? In the name of truth, in the name of science, um, He's just ignoring so much about the human condition and he thinks he's saving the world and he's really not. Um, and he's not going to take responsibility, I don't think. Um, you know, he's written other books and it's, I mean, after the opioid crisis, I'm sure he's probably changed his mind or maybe modified his view. But I just wanted to take this one book because 
he's responsible for this, right? If he had been wiser, he could have prevented the, the opioid crisis. And that's my point, right? You have to learn from these stories to prevent problems. So he didn't prevent it. So he's going back. I don't know. He might say, oh, well, I needed to say this or that, but I don't. I don't anticipate he'd ever take responsibility. He would ever think that he should have known. I don't think he would ever think he should have known. And he, he's morally culpable for that. But it's not that difficult. You know, if I think he should be held accountable, I'm not asking for a Superman. <laughs> he's the one who thinks he's Superman, right? Not me. I'm asking for some common sense and, and resisting the fact that you're getting all this status. Just forget it, you know, think about what is missing. Go ask the average person on the street, you know, <laughs> get out of your office, get away from your elite um, group of buddies. So I'm going to give you another break, and then I'm, we're going to have one more round of everybody's reaction, and then I'll let you go early. Um, how about if we make this just a 10-minute break, so that, and then it'd be maybe 15 minutes for you all to talk, although it can always be longer, and um, even if, you know, I could say you have to stay 15 minutes. If students want to go, but other ones want to stay and talk, I'm all in for it. You know, it's great. So I'll give you 10 minutes. It's 15 after the hour of my time. So it'll be 25 after. Okay. Okay. So um, I think uh, there's a potential for us. Uh, in liberal arts institutions to bring together high level of science, high level of social science, high level of humanities and have the best education that's ever existed. <laughs> and then there's the real world. Um, <clears throat> so I want you to be bold on your final papers and to really create your idea of the best synthesis. And I also want you to know that you all know more than I know about psychology, social science. Really, I didn't have to study anything I didn't want to in college because it was the 60s. <laughs> so, you know, I'm really undereducated. And so I do learn a lot from my students. Um, and I don't think my criticisms of Damasio, I don't think. I think I know a lot. I just think he thinks he knows more than he does. <laughs> or he has more control over situations than he does. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying I know more science than he knows or anything. I just think he thinks. He has his neural, his neural maps are too simplistic. He needs to form a more sophisticated network of neural maps, especially in his imagination, in his idea, the image in his head of the human condition. If you, if you think of all those deities and all those energies, and you think of how people run into, you know, they pursue things based on their love of justice or truth or beauty and then they disregard other people and they get into big fights because they, they care about their sacred passion, which is sacred. It's a good thing. It's just that when you obsess about it, it becomes bad. Or when you use that to justify ignoring people or putting them down or whatever, it all, it all goes south. And that's what Mr. Damasio does. He's obsessed about Apollo and he ignores, you know, all this other stuff. And so what he thinks he's gonna do is gonna be the opposite. That's called the nemesis effect. 
you're so obsessed about something that it actually turns out 180. And a great example of that is when a country gets so obsessed about another country being a militaristic society and they're going to come and get us that this country becomes a militaristic society, right? Even worse than the one that they're obsessed about. So, so I think he's just out of balance, that's all. It's, it's not that I think I know more than he knows at all. I just noticed the balance issue and the mean between extremes issue and all this stuff that really should have been a part of a good liberal arts education. And that's the, the reading for next time. Among other things, it's about that. So, okay, Amal, what have you got? Wrap up for today. Mm, I just want to say, like, I found this reading very interesting. And, like, you know, Damasio and, and you know, the compatibility with Apollo. And, like, because uh, I think, like, uh, uh, it, it like of uh, the Damasio uh, perspective tries to you know promote this well-being and you know the healthy side but like like as I read in the chapters uh, like like people should you know um, think that tragedy for example is not uh, inevitable or you know a uh, to, uh, like people should avoid this complexity and you know live in that way but I think sometimes we need to um, you know accept this unhappiness and face it in order to um, you know like overcome it and um, have have more beneficial consequences on you know our lives and others yeah so you can take pride in the fact that you don't oversimplify, right? Yeah, we cannot just say like, try, like we can simply avoid tragedy or we can simply avoid these old complexities in life. And but you can teach yourself to get more pleasure and happiness out of that, right? Yeah. It's just that you have to teach yourself that. That's not gonna just come naturally. Yeah. Good. Um, Fardeen. Are you there, Fardeen? Hello? Uh, yes. Professor, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, uh, it's been really interesting. I look forward to reading the next uh, three chapters. And I feel like um, this book has been helping me um, sort of realize what I want to do for my final paper. I mean, it was very abstract before, but yeah, I've been narrowing it down since I've started reading this. Okay, good. Um, Aurora? Uh, yes, Professor, I have nothing to say now. That's it, I I'm, uh, agree with you. Yeah, that's it. Okay, is my stuff easier to read? Is it hard to read my stuff or is it? Um, uh, for me, a uh, little bit hard. For you, what? Uh, for me, a little bit hard. A little bit hard? Yeah, for me. Okay. Is it easier than a lot of the other stuff? Uh, not at all, Professor. Okay. Oh, not that hard, you said. Okay. Um, Masoma? Uh, yes, Professor. Uh, professor, like as others, I, I also like found the readings very interesting and also convincing. And I think, yeah, uh, uh, Demosio like oversimplifying, uh, sim simplifying like everything about the drug uh, things and neuroscience. I think uh, like about when it comes to goddess, Professor, I found it very interesting. I mean, the myth that ancient Greeks had like uh, it reminds me what Augustine was saying about God is that you know like God is one and perfect because if it is two and one is less perfect then uh, it's not God because it, it cannot be less perfect or uh, or it, it can only be perfect on one form because 
if they are if there is two god and they are exactly same and same power but then it, it does not make sense and uh, uh yeah i i think like augustine's idea in this sense is more like a form of you know the ideal form that uh, polto was talking that the ideal form is one and perfect and it cannot change so but then i think like uh, this myth also result that you know ancient greece or uh, ancient greek people write a lot of poem about the goddesses and this myth and there's literature there's imitators that you know emit this god's uh, image and everything which are like involved with kind of art things so i think uh, those are good but then yeah uh, it it can be also misused and some people misuse it to you know take uh, like uh, dominancy and uh, related to the gods and then corrupt it but then yeah some people use it you know to make people more fun like for for people to make fun and then you know to have fun sorry like uh, they imitated gods and then uh, yeah the artistic value of these things and then uh, yeah professor i found it interesting i mean uh, you mentioned sometimes that uh, people might think that why we are studying about this goddess but then i found it really interesting uh, i i really like to know about the greek society that how they using this goddess and and how they believe and then yeah how so for some people it helped them and some people misuse this yeah, it was interesting to know. Thank you, Professor. So the one thing about the, okay, so I did say that in the Greeks, there ultimately there is noose, right? The stuff all comes together in a certain model of wisdom, but it's not like the monotheism of uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And, um, you know, those religions you can pick out stories and you can find things you just have to be really careful when you have that monotheism that in the name of god you don't oversimplify right you don't right because it can easily lead to a worldview that's too simplistic here's the good guys yeah. here's the bad guys right yes yeah and so the greeks are not letting you do that <laughs> so the life of the mind is not relativism you can find the patterns but the goal of a human life is to make good judgment in situations that many of them you did not control this it was a bunch of irrational people that get wise people into these rotten situations where they have to make decisions about things that they never, it's not their fault, but they still have to make these choices. And there is a better and worse. Every tragedy, every story does have a character that comes out being the wisest, but some of those characters do make mistakes along the way. And so- Yeah, yeah and I guess like some people might say that, okay, even God make mistakes, and he is God, but then we are human beings, so we might also make mistakes. Okay, uh, but then the point is, you know, to uh, how to get out of this and then learn from our mistakes. I think like it's up to people how they interpret it and get those ideas. Right, but the thing is to keep talking to people, right? So I agree with your interpretation for this reason, or I disagree for this reason, right? And that's how you develop your mind your understanding of good and evil um yeah okay good um now do you have a reaction no professor okay um asia do you have something yeah no professor not much new thing just rephrasing my previous things uh it's like we, the human beings, are making our choices, and uh, whenever we are making the choices, we need to um, think about uh, think from different points of views, so that uh, we may not get the oversimplified the oversimplified version of anything. So yeah, that's it. Okay, good. Um, I think as women, you probably realize that a lot of men don't understand your perspective. And so you do understand that kind of blindness 
that people think they're doing what's right, but they don't have any empathy with women. They don't understand. Maybe they're trying to, but they they don't get it. Just that kind of stuff. Um, so I think you know you're a good audience for the the idea that things are complex because I think you're in the midst of that. You probably know people that have good intentions, but they they don't get it uh, in some way. Um, okay, Saida, what about you? Oh, Aisha, you want to say something else? No, okay. Saida, are you there? Okay, Isabel? Yes. Who's here? Saida, is that you? No. Yes, Professor. Did you want to say something? I guess not. Isabel, are you there? Right. Oh, okay, Isabel, her her microphone isn't working and she's trying to fix it. Okay, very good. Uh, oh, Saida said, um, okay, so she's, she said the ones, um, people are getting picked on, um, how people cope with depression. Yeah, that's a problem I was gonna say. I, I've had students that, you know, sometimes I just really, question things because I like I'll have a student who says he couldn't do his homework because he was depressed and you know usually I'll just like yeah and then I go see him and he's screwing around you know spending hours and hours playing this stupid game with these big uh water guns you know that shoot water and they're having some big huge contest and it's some big deal and I just that's hard right I mean, you want to understand his depression, but it just seems to me like you're not trying hard enough. I, I, you have to try, that's all. Just show me you're trying to get your homework done. <laughs> um, and then another girl was depressed, but she just rapidly defended female pornography, right? I've had two women that just, female pornography is great and women are learning how to use the tools that men use to make money and blah blah but both of them were like seriously depressed they've both been raped I just really you know I just I just wish people would try right it seems and those girls yeah they were depressed so again I don't know a lot I just observe a few things and I just think, have we really got a grip on this? Um, I, I don't know, but I'm not gonna say, you know, write it off, but I, I'm not gonna say, oh, you, you say that? Oh boy, hands off, you don't have to do your homework, you know? <laughs> um, and so on the other hand, the AUW students, oh my God, they have, a lot of them are depressed and I'm telling you they have circumstances not like my students in the US. And so of course I would be hands off um, because I also think because they're not privileged, they will develop strength of mind because they have to, they don't have a choice. Um, my sister married a guy who inherited a family fortune, like his job is to manage the family fortune to make sure everybody can pass on a fortune to their kids. And his kids have trouble with depression because they don't have to wake up in the morning and do something, right? And so, so I mean, I don't know how much of that is partly the environment, just in the sense that you don't have enough privilege to be depressed right? You just have to function and you have to find friends and you have to carry on and whatever. But, but of course, it seems to me 
that it would be nice for you to have some Prozac or something for a while, right? I had a student who lost her mother and all this stuff happened. And she said she took Prozac for a couple of years because it was just a huge setback. That makes sense, right? Um, there's just lots of nuance about it. And, um, and the other thing I wanted to point out was um, the colonization thing. This, this could get really complicated because on the one hand, for developing countries to just blindly accept all this stuff, oh, the neuroscience is gonna really help us because a huge percentage of our people have depression. Well, that's fine, I would never. But on the other hand, to what extent have they colonized your minds, right? And convinced you that they're going to save you. <laughs> but in the meantime, they're destroying, you're having floods and hurricanes and cyclones and air pollution. And, you know, like that doesn't count as something that might make you depressed uh, or more desperate, you know? They don't do anything to, to prevent problems. And they are making a lot of money on fixing your problems. And again, it's just a question. I just want somebody to make it more complex than that. And then if people start questioning all these drugs, then you go say, oh, these primitive people, they're so backward and they're so anti-science and they're, they're never gonna develop, right? Oh, come on, that's not fair. Um, all right, so this colonialism, how much is that playing in consciously or not, right? Um, Diana, are you next? So I think we just have Diana and Follick left and then I'll let you go. Do you have anything to say, Diana? Or I think your machine was having troubles. Um, what about Follick, do you have something? No, Professor. Okay. So, I mean, you do have to remember I'm not a highly respected person. I'm not in the field. I'm just uh, asking questions. That's it. Um, all right. So, next time, what is that next Sunday for you? We just have that one last Damasio, and then the next week we'll meet one time um, Tuesday. So we only have two more meetings, um, but I hope it goes well and I hope you understand. And next time, I mean, you can tell me that maybe I should have signed this book earlier so you could have gotten more ideas about, I don't know, you know, if you have ideas about structuring the class differently or whatever, just let me know because I haven't taught this class very many times so far. So. Um, all right, take care. 